All right. Welcome everybody to this new short talks session number four. Uh, my name is Davide Valeriani. I'm uh, uh, the MC for um, this session, the moderator. And on the back, we have um, Ella Bati doing some backhand like support. Hopefully, like won't be needed today. So we have three amazing speakers today um, that you can see on the screen already. And uh, uh, again, like as every other session, every speaker will have 12 minutes and then uh, for the presentation. And then after that, we'll have three minutes for Q&A. So feel free to ask questions using the ask a question button to the uh, left of your chat at the bottom. And, uh, um, and we'll answer them um, at the end of each talk. So the first talk today is from Brandon Benson uh, uh, from Stanford. And uh, the title is an optogenetic theory of stimulation near criticality. So Brandon, uh, welcome. Thank you for presenting today. And uh, if you want to go ahead and share your screen, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. So my name is Brandon Benson. I'm in Surrey Ganguly's lab at Stanford and I collaborate with Jonathan Cadman who's now a professor at Hebrew University. First off, I wanna go through an experiment. This was a collaboration between experimentalists and computationalists. On the computation side, it was myself and Jonathan Cadman. And on the experiment side, James Marshall, Timothy Mikado, and Sean Quirin. So in this experiment, we have a mouse. We just train it to, when it sees vertical bars, it licks. And when it sees horizontal bars, it doesn't lick. And then we're doing calcium imaging all the while. So we can identify the set of neurons that prefer each of the visual cues. This is in mouse V1 and layer two, three, or layer five. I'm gonna focus on layer five. Oops. So, and then, so what we can do is ramp up, you, we can use optogenetic stimulation once we've identified those neurons. We can stimulate those neurons, ramping up the stimulation while ramping down the visual cue. So ultimately what you have is, is sort of mind control. You, you don't give any visual cue at all. You're just stimulating these neurons and the mouse is performing the behavior correctly. So then we can ask how many neurons are needed to produce this behavior. And surprisingly, it only takes 20 or less neurons for the mouse to be reliably performing this behavior. And performing a behavior we can assume takes thousands, millions of neurons even. So there's a huge amplification going on here. There's, there's this high sensitivity that only 20 neurons could elicit such a large response. And where is this amplification happening? It could be happening within the network that we're looking at, or it could be happening somewhere else in the brain downstream. So to answer that question, we can look at the fraction of neurons in the network that we're, that we're looking at, which are co-activated with our stimulated neurons. And we find that a large fraction up to like 0.3 of the neurons that we're looking at are activated along with the neurons that we stimulate. And the network size that we're looking at here is around 5,000 neurons. So 0.3 of those is a lot. And uh, ultimately, we have an amplification of around 100 times going on here. And that, that becomes a theoretical question. How do, we, how do we explain the sensitivity in biological networks? One theory is the theory of criticality. It's a concept from thermodynamics, statistical physics. And the big takeaway from this theory is when you're between two distinct phases of activity, when you're poised right between those two phases, then you see scale-free patterns of activity called avalanches. So a quick example that I just took from a colloquium given by Miguel Munoz. If you have a contact process, so we have a graph with active and unactive nodes, then activity spreads with a rate of lambda and activity dies out with a rate of mu. So if lambda is really small, then activity will just die out everywhere. And you have what's called an absorbing phase. But if lambda is really large, then the activity will dominate and you have an active phase. So those are our two phases. And if you're poised right between them, then that's criticality. And when you analyze the avalanche activity, 
right there, you see a power law, which is a scale-free function. So that's what we have, our two phases of activity and scale-free avalanches. And um, the application to the experiment is that these avalanches could serve as a mechanism, that small stimulations might be avalanching into large responses. But our neural systems really at criticality. Criticality is a concept from thermodynamics. So you, you take n to infinity, but neural systems are finite and they're biological. So we wouldn't expect them to be poised exactly between these two phases. And there are other issues with determining criticality with experimental data that like subsampling and binning. And so it would be nice to have a theory which goes beyond criticality, which includes near critical systems and we can ask, what is the effect of optogenetic stimulation? And answering this question would explain the experimental findings that we have. So here I'm going to start with a model. I'm going to use a spiking network. And that's because optogenetic stimulation is very precise temporally. Spike jitters can be as small as one millisecond. So the assumptions of a rate network are not going to hold up here. We, we really need a spiking network. So it's going to be recurrent and excitation and inhibition. Each neuron I integrates a membrane voltage V. It's a leaky integration. There's recurrent input spikes and external spikes. And it does this integration with a time constant tau of 20 milliseconds. When the membrane voltage reaches a threshold of theta, then it fires, it resets to zero, and it stays there for a refractory period of two milliseconds before continuing to integrate. And the spike transmission delay there is 1.5 milliseconds. So then we can, for the connectivity matrix, we can decompose the recurrent activity into a two by two matrix for the excitatory and, in, and inhibitory populations, and then a random matrix of zeros and ones that's sparse. And the excitatory connections are going to have a postsynaptic potential of J and inhibitory will have minus G times J. Okay. And so we take the mean field theory of this model and we find, um, thinking back to this theory of criticality, we need those two phases and we, we find that. Um, sorry, the axes here, G is the ratio between inhibition and excitation. And V is the non-dimensionalized non scale of the external input. So here in this region, the mean field theory gives a stationary solution that's stable. So the mean firing rate is constant, and we call that asynchronous activity. And then we find a hop bifurcation. So oscillations occur in this region, and those lead to synchronous activity patterns. And you can get there through the hop bifurcation or through a saddle node-like bifurcation. And when we look at a point, which is not through the hop or the saddle node, but near both of them here, we do find the scale-free avalanches. So our model is showing criticality. And now we can return to this question that we want to answer with theory. What is the effect of optogenetic stimulation near criticality? So with this model, we can look, let's look at a number of points that are on the stable side, so in the asynchronous side of, of activity. We just look at a number of points, not at criticality, but near criticality, and see if we can develop a theory of optogenetic stimulation. So what we do is, again, we take the mean field theory of the model, and we get the a master equation of dynamics. P is uh, distribution over the membrane voltages, that are in the system. Um, this distribution doesn't describe everything because some neurons have fired and then are in their refractory period. So we have a latent state. Uh, and this distribution we call B, and that keeps track of the neurons in refractory period. There's a lot of terms here, but I want to point out that we have new stim, and this can be a function of time. So we can stimulate with any pattern of activity and see how the system responds. There's normalization and boundary conditions, and then the main readout of the system is the firing rate, which is a the firing rate nu, which is a function of the latent refractory period state. 
Okay, so I'm going to go through this really slowly because this is the main result. Uh, we, we numerically integrate that theory, and let's now look at the, the, the response to optogenetic stimulation at a number of points. So let's start with point A from, our, from the phase diagram. At point A, um, and I'm plotting firing rate on a log scale here, and the um, so it's just it has some constant firing rate up till time zero when a stimulation occurs, and there's different stimulation scales here. So the smallest of them is blue. If we stimulate with 0.24 hertz, then we get a small jump in firing rate. In black is the theory. And in color is the simulations. And those are just Euler integrations of the model forward in time. And I actually plot 10 simulations of each color, just so you can see any variability that comes out. So we're seeing a good match there. If we increase the stimulation size to 0.8 hertz, then something much different happens. We have an event occurring. And since this is on a log scale, this is really a huge event that's taking place. So the system goes from no response at all to a very large response. And it's a discrete event. It's just one event that's taking place. And if we continue to ramp up the stimulation to 2.4 hertz, then we see a number of these events taking place, five in this case. So qualitatively, this uh, A and B, we see that there's discrete events taking place where at D, it's more of a continuous response. And at C, we see some hybrid. Um, C is of note because it's the closest point to criticality. I can quantify this in a different way. So if, I, if the x-axis becomes the stimulation strength, then um, I can, Tomino. thank you, we can quantify the average change in firing rate in the theory and in the simulations. And that average change is called delta nu. In the, we run a lot of simulations, and so we get a number of values for delta nu for each simulation, and there's noise. Um, and so that we, we can then plot the probability distribution over those. So in color, in red in this case, is a heat map of all those simulation results as we, as we ramp up the stimulation strength. And the three dotted lines are the colors that correspond to these three stimulation strengths. And we see this, this, um, this response that's beyond linear response theory. We, you know, it's this really complicated stair step, uh, staircase effect that our theory is capturing. And the theory is in black. So, and, and we don't see that at point D, we see a, like a continuous response there. And at point C, near criticality, we have this hybrid where it's not really a staircase, but it's smoothing out. Um, so it's between those two. And then we see a lot of trial to trial variability. So if I take the orange trials, and instead of plotting firing rate on the y axis, if I plot that as the color intensity, and stack 30 of them together and, and sort them, then we see the onset time is uh, varies a lot for like, over 100 milliseconds. So qualitatively, we have those um, different responses. I can change the type of stimulation. So here I'm doing a pulse of less than one millisecond. And I don't have time to go through all of this, but it's a similar story. And we that's nice because optogenetic stimulation can be that precise for one millisecond. So ultimately, we we wanted to explain this experimental sensitivity. You could do that with criticality, but we've gone beyond that. So we can just, we can show near criticality. And you can, if you probe the system with optogenetic stimulation, then you see these qualitative differences on either side of criticality. And you see hybrid responses close to criticality. Ultimately, we, we show here a theoretical framework for interpreting circuit responses to optogenetic stimulation, and a means to identify the operating regime of circuits that exhibit high sensitivity or scale-free avalanches as found in cortical circuits. So thank you to you and to my lab, Ad Maiorium de Gloria. Awesome. Thank you so much uh, for the great presentation, Brandon. Um, there is now time for a few questions. I've seen like from the 
chat there was a discussion about um, a scale free what did you mean by a scale free uh, and whether that's just an, another example of a uh, like exponential decay for example as another scale free function so there there are obviously a lot of scientific details and what exactly is meant by scale free but a power law is a good example of a function that is scale free so that's at least one signature there's there's more there um but for now just say that so do, do you use the scale the scale free term uh, just to refer so, to power laws um no it means more than that so there's okay. there's more power laws than what i showed the exponents have a scaling relation between them even the shape of the avalanches have to collapse to a scaling function so there, there's a lot more there um but just to be quick, I just showed the power law. A power law is scale free, by the way, because if you change the scale of the variable in a power law, say divide by some constant C, you get out the same function. You get out still a power law. So that's unique to, that's called scale free. All right. Um, and we have another question about, um, so are the experimental results, uh, do they correspond to theory spiking network simulation? So um, qualitatively, yes. Um, qualitatively, we're just trying to show an amplification of around 100 times that we're seeing in experiments. And we, we can see amplifications of, that are that large. Right. All right, so thank you so much. We can move on to the next talk. And if anybody has further questions, we can take them at the end. So feel free to keep asking them um, in the chat or in the ask a question button. So thank you, Brandon, for the talk.